Thank you, everybody, and thank you for being here. Lovely of you, of you to come. Uh, may I begin by uh, acknowledging that we're on the country of the Wurundjeri people, the Woiwurrung, and pay our respects as to their elders past and present. Um, in a spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us are located on this traditional country of Australia's first scientists, the many different Indigenous peoples who belong to the diverse lands of what we now call Victoria. We're gathered here at the Society's headquarters on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, as I mentioned, uh, people of the Kulin Nation, and I enjoy and I invite uh, particularly people online, on YouTube and I think Facebook, uh, to identify uh, where they are at tonight uh, in, the, uh, in, in the chat function of those, of those facilities. Tonight we're delighted, this is our, probably our most, this is our most important award of the year. We have only a few. Uh, we, we are delighted two or three weeks ago to have presentations from our eight young scientists uh, and they were spectacular. It's wonderful to see such work being done. My personal observation was it was amazing that each of them in different fields made the point that I do hope there'll be enough money for me to resource this work in the future, which disappointed me a lot because we know that there's insufficient resources to facilitate some of the great research that's going on. So we've got these... PhDs and postdocs coming out of our system and they're just not sure whether they're going to, and they're brilliant and they're the leaders in their fields, but they're just not sure whether they're going to be able to continue. But nevertheless, uh, tonight we have someone who is a leader in her field uh, and she is um, Professor Rachel Bookbinder. Uh, she's going to present tonight on optimising healthcare for people with muscul musculoskeletal conditions. She is the society's winner of the 2022 Medal for Excellence in Scientific Research, awarded in Category 2, Biomedical and Health Sciences. Let me introduce you to her. Professor Rachel Bookbinder, AOFA. I don't know, what, what's FAHMS, Rachel? In medical, what is it, Pete? Australian Health and Medical Sciences. There you are. Uh, and is an Australian NHMR, M, NHMR, I know what that is, NHMRC investigator of the National Health and Medical Research Council, uh, investigator fellow. She's been the director of the Monash Cabrini Department of Musculoskeletal Health and Clinical Epidemiology since its inception in 2001, that's a long time, and a professor in the Monash University Department of Epi Epidemiology and Preventative Medicine since 2007. She's a rheumatologist and clinical epidemiologist who combines clinical practice with research in a wide range of multidisciplinary projects relating to arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions. Professor Bookbinder recently chaired the steering group for the Lancet Low Back Pain Series, a series of three papers published in March 2018 that drew attention to the urgent need for action to reduce the current and projected disease burden from low back pain. I might talk to you later, Rachel. In particular, it outlined the epidemic of low value care for low back pain across the world and identified promising solutions. Professor Rachel Bookbinder is the 2002, as I mentioned, recipient of the Royal Society of Victoria's Medal for, Sci for Excellence in Scientific Research. She'll be awarded the medal following her lecture by Laureate Professor Peter Doherty AC, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Victoria. Rachel, Rachel, come up and say a few, tell a few words. I always ask, yes, congratulations. Where did I, we need to know a little bit, just go back a bit earlier. Where did all this start? Uh, so Why? <laughs> uh, well, I started off wanting to be a physiotherapist, but I read a book about it and went to open day and changed my mind. So <laughs> I then wanted to be a doctor. Right. So I've always and when was that? So when did you, where did you study? Uh, I, well, on my next Oh, are you going to tell us I'm all about tell it? You, but You're going to tell us all about I it. Well, I might let you do ash. that. So look, we'll, let's uh, listen to Rajal's uh, presentation, which I'm sure we'll enjoy. There'll be a little bit of time for some questions at the end, and then we'll, uh, Peter will present it with a prize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honoured to be uh, uh, awarded this uh, medal. Uh, and so I'm just going to start with a little bit about me. So I, I studied medicine at Monash University uh, and at Prince Henry's Hospital, for those of you who don't remember Prince Henry's. I did my internship and residency and uh, physician training 
uh, at the Alfred, and then I did my rheumatology training at the Alfred and Prince Henry's as well. And then I went overseas uh, with uh, my husband and one son uh, to Toronto, and I did some more clinical work. Um, but I sort of fell into doing a Master's of Clinical Epidemiology, which just basically changed the trajectory of my career. Uh, I came back to Australia in 1993 and started in private practice, so I still see patients one day a week uh, in Malvern. And I started on a journey of doing clinical research, initially just research that I didn't need funding for, and then I've been lucky enough to have support from the NHMRC since about 2002. Uh, I did a PhD in 2006 by publication because my boss, uh, John McNeil, wanted me to, uh, so uh, I did that. And, and as, as before, I was the founding director of our department at Cabrini, but we've recently parted ways and, and our group of about 32 people have moved back to the School of Public Health at Monash. Um, so I met my husband in the medical course and uh, Danny is a medical oncologist at Peter Mac, just stepped down as the head of medical oncology. Uh, we have uh, three sons. The first one was born in my final year of training, which was pretty difficult. Wasn't allowed to do shared time at that, at, you know, half time training. Uh, the second one, uh, that's me pregnant in Toronto. Uh, the, my second son was born in, in Toronto and yes, he has a Canadian passport and he was actually born on Canada Day in, in Toronto. And then we had our third son, uh, all three sons are here uh, on my return. Uh, and I'm pleased to say I've got two gorgeous grandchildren, a, a boy and a girl. So that's about it for the personal stuff. So epidemiology, and I'm sure you, if you if those of you that are not medical uh, will have heard lots from epidemiologists in the last couple of years because of COVID. But it's really the basic science of, of medicine. There's classic or big E epidemiology, which is more oriented to public health. So thinking about the prevention of disease in the population, uh, for example, what caused COVID to spread, what public health measures should we, should we institute. And clinical epidemiology, which is what I studied, applies exactly the same sort of science, but to clinical questions. So asking what works in the clinic, how do I diagnose this, what's the best treatment? And both of these uh, approaches use the same scientific tools to minimise bias and, and provide evidence that's closest to the truth. And what clinical epidemiology taught me was to ask questions. And I've, I've always asked questions, um, but, but really not to accept anything as gospel, but to understand where the evidence came, comes from and whether it's backed up by high quality evidence. And as we know, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of uh, problems with science and people questioning science. And, and, and I think that um, that's a really big problem. So I'm going to show you just a couple of um, projects that I've been involved with over the journey, starting with public health messaging to improve health, uh, trials to establish the true benefits of, and harms of treatment, optimising the quality of health care and reducing low value care, and raising public awareness about this problem of too much medicine. And finally, some words about uh, collaborations and partnerships to improve health. So when I came back from uh, Canada, uh, uh, I was invited to evaluate the Victorian Work Cover Authority public health campaign, Back Pain Don't, light, light, uh, take, don't take It Lying Down. Uh, and basically everyone else in the department took a step back, so I thought, okay, I'll, I've got nothing else to do, I'm, I may as well give it a go. And I don't know if any of you uh, remember the ads, um, I thought I'd I'll start first with what do we know about back pain? So um, Rob, uh, most people get back pain uh, at some point in their lives. Most people get better quickly, whatever you do, but it often recurs. And it's actually one of the leading causes of disability in the, in the world. And there's basically the, the predominant reason for the disability is this ongoing epidemic of low value care, often useless care and sometimes harmful care. There are widespread misconceptions amongst both doctors and the public about how we manage back pain. And it's been very difficult to change accepted societal and medical beliefs. So the Victorian Work Cover Authority had been trying for about a decade to improve care for back pain. 
Uh, and the costs from workers' compensation claims had tripled over 10 years to mid, uh, mid 1990s. And so they decided they'd embark on a public media campaign. The campaign was based on very clear and very simple messages that were evidence-based that most people with back pain can stay active, they don't need to rest for prolonged periods, they can stay at work, and imaging is, isn't usually helpful in most cases. Basically, you can self-manage your pain. The primary medium of the campaign were uh, television commercials, and at that point there was only public television, uh, so and we were captive to it, and, and the whole population would watch things like the cricket or the football, and that's when these ads were aired. There were other things that happened as well, but it was really the media campaign that was the biggest thing. Importantly, the Work Cover Authority got everybody to collaborate. So every single type of doctor that manages back pain, whether they be surgeons, rehab doctors, GPs, uh, chiropractors, everyone was in the room and agreed on the main messages. They also got agreement from the, the unions and employers, so everybody was on side. They made sure the laws um, were helpful in terms of keeping people at work and they, we, we, the campaign happened. So I don't know if this will work, but we'll see. I just thought I'd show you an ad. Going around out there with those exercises. But what they didn't realise was, I've got a back problem, a disc bulge that gives me a lot of pain. And it'd give me a lot more pain if I didn't give it a lot of exercise. So if you've got back pain, give exercise a go through sport or any other way for that matter. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but uh, there was a young Shane Warne in the background there, bowling. Uh, so that this was one of the ads. So the ads were really clever. They used role models. We, they used uh, comedians, uh, which I'll show you an ad at the very end if we have time. Uh, they used uh, different clinicians. And basically, they were really catchy ads. They were endorsed always by one, one form of doctor or another. And I, I was charged with um, my colleagues in evaluating it. And we, we basically did two sorts of studies. We looked at the population beliefs of the general population, and we looked at uh, GPs' attitudes, beliefs, and their stated management. And then we also were able to look at the actual claims data and compare this to New South Wales and South Australia. So this depicts the campaign. It was a very intense ad campaign for about three months. And then, then it was much more low key. Uh, and then in the last three months, it was more intense again, as you can see by the blue bars. We were able to um, uh, measure population beliefs before it started, about two years in and afterwards. And then we obtained funding independently and were able to do a follow-up um, survey a couple of years later. We also surveyed GPs um, before and after the campaign, and again, we had independent funding, so we were able to look at GPs again a few years later. We used what's called a quasi-experimental design, uh, random samples of the population and GPs at each time point, and we used uh, New South Wales as a controlled state, so there was no ads in New South Wales, and we excluded people who lived on the border. Importantly, I don't know if anyone remembers, but at the end of 1999, quite surprisingly, the government in Victoria changed. And we had planned for top-up ads every year. But as of the end of 1999, there, was, there has not been a single other ad shown. Everyone in Work Cover Authority left and went to the wheat board. Uh, and <laughs> no, one, no one even remembers the ads uh, at the Work Cover. Um, but people, they often call me because they know about the campaign. So this is the results of the population survey. These are back pain beliefs. And on the, on the left is New South Wales. And you can see that over the duration of the campaign, there was absolutely no change in mean beliefs in New South Wales among the general population. But there was a significant improvement in Victoria. And then it was, it was even more improved after that second intense um, period at the end of the campaign. We found over time that this, this difference was sustained, but there has been some decay, and I expect 
that this is now quite a long time ago and probably it's delayed even further. Uh, it was unfortunate that we couldn't keep going with the ads. It also significantly improved doctors' uh, beliefs and attitudes and stated management of back pain. And again, there was no change in New South Wales doctors. It resulted in significantly fewer number of people putting in claims for workers' compensation for back pain, more than 3,000. And uh, it significantly reduced the costs, the duration of um, being off work, so they were less disabled, and also the medical costs. There was one group of doctors, uh, one group of people that did not change as a result of the campaign, and they were doctors who had a special interest in back pain. They were the only group that weren't receptive to the ads. Uh, they continued to improve that you needed to rest the back, that you needed imaging. And importantly, there was no difference between them and the doctors in, Victoria, in New South Wales. Uh, everyone else changed, so irrespective of if you saw the ads, if you spoke English, if you were uh, your socioeconomic status, the, the job you did, everybody in the general population improved on average by the same amount, except for these doctors. And I'll come back to the reasons for that might be later on. So in summary, the media campaign, they're powerful. We target the entire population, so that provides social support to change. It includes difficult to reach and high risk groups because everybody's seeing the ads. And if you can shift what is considered normal thinking, then you have less effort required to maintain that. And at the same time as the population changed, the doctors also changed. So it's, it was a way of reaching the doctors uh, and that had not been able to be, happen before that. It was relatively cheap. It cost $10.1 million over three years. Most of it was the ad, buying the advertising time. And we did a back of envelope um, about how much it might have saved. And, and the estimate is about $65 million over those three years. We learned it's a very complex system. There are many players. And we need to get everybody on side. And we also know there are vested interests. There are and, and politics, and both of these are significant barriers to uh, trying to change um, healthcare uh, for, for good. It's actually been replicated in many countries with varying success. It's still ongoing in Alberta, Canada. Unfortunately, uh, it's, it's a good 20 years later and thing, not much has changed. Uh, care for back pain remains um, terrible. Uh, massive overuse of things like imaging, opioids, surgery, injections, spinal cord stimulators, and the list goes on. Uh, a lot of these things have been proven not to work and some of them can be harmful. And we're wasting vast sums of money. And because of this, uh, this, this is a, a, an a article in The Economist that was actually written after we published the Lancet series. Uh, but what happened in about 2015, I was sick of trying my best to change what doctors do and it seemed to be getting worse and worse. So I decided I just approached the editor of The Lancet, Richard Horton, and I rang him up and he happened to be coming to Australia very soon after that. And I said, I really want to do this series. And he said, I'd love you to, and like, which is a real shock for me. I don't think I usually ask for things. Um, and so he asked me to assemble people from around the world. So I had 31 authors from 12 countries, uh, and we importantly had people from low and middle income countries. And what we wanted to achieve was to try and stop the same problems happening in developing countries. But once we started to write um, these papers, we realised that it was already too late. And, and the same things that happen in Australia and America and the UK also are happening in places like Brazil and India and the Middle East. Uh, because I'd learned about the powerfulness, if that's a word, of the mass media, we actually hired a media company to help us to get the messages out there. This was really a call to action for the world to try and stop harming people and stop this disability from back pain. And we had this amazing um, team who were in the UK and Switzerland, uh, and we had a plan for when we tweet and what we do in each country. And we had almost 15 million people uh, seeing uh, something about uh, the series on the first day that we launched. Uh, it also happened to be the day that we launched our clinical trial network that I'll tell you about in the end. 
and we were lucky enough to have the health minister come along to that. So that, that really garnered a lot of publicity in Australia uh, and it didn't hurt that his mother also has a problem with back pain. So that really helped. Uh, and we, we looked at where we had media and there was actually wall-to-wall -wall coverage in Australia. That means you know, radio, television, all the newspapers, everywhere. And we actually had 594 stories over 41 countries. And we looked at what the stories were about. And in fact, most of them were accurate. Uh, but the majority of the ones that um, we didn't like were actually used to promote something like, you know, a specific treatment for sticking something on your back that would fix you. And, you know, so we, this is an unintended consequence that happens all the time and we didn't expect that. Okay, so I'm moving along now to the second thing I want to talk about, which is um, trials to establish the true value of treatment. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but as we speak today, only one in 20 treatments that we provide to our patients has high certainty evidence that support its benefits. And this has been found in several studies, most recently uh, this year, uh, where they looked at over 1,500 interventions and looked to see what the evidence was for them. And there was only high certainty evidence in about one in 20. So I, that's a shocking statistic I want you to think about. So now I'm going to do a little experiment with you um, to see what you know about high quality evidence. So let's imagine that we have 19 patients and each patient we have a measure of their pain before treatment, which are the red bars, and in green after treatment. And that they're plotted there on that graph. When you average out their pain levels before treatment, so zero out of 10, where 10 is the most excruciating pain and zero is no pain, on average, across these 19 people, the average score is eight out of 10. And after they've had the treatment, the average score has gone down to about three out of 10. Okay, sounds good? So do you think this treatment works? Hands up if you think the treatment works. Looks amazing, miraculous. Okay. So let's talk about perceived versus true benefits of treatment. The right scientific answer is that we can't tell. And it's something called, it's a logical fallacy called post hoc ergo propter uh, hoc which is Latin for it follows, therefore it's because of. And we all do it all the time. Something happens and, and we think it's because of whatever was happening at the time. So we get better because we took um, orange juice and our cold got better. So we think that's what cured the cold. Uh, and so science is no difference. You can't tell if something gets better that you've observed without a control group. And if you don't have a control group that didn't get the treatment, you can't tell whether the treatment was the actual cause of the improvement or not. The fairest test is what's called a randomised placebo-controlled trial, where people who are otherwise very similar get randomised to either having the treatment or having a pretend treatment or placebo treatment, and they're assigned at random. And the best and fairest study is where no one knows what the patient got, the participant got. So neither the participants nor the doctors or the other healthcare professionals know what the participants received. And that's called a randomised placebo control trial. So now I'm going to give you an example from one of our studies called um, uh, vertebroplasty, which I'll explain in a minute. And this is used to treat uh, osteoporotic spinal fractures. And it's called the, the mysterious case of the disappearing effect size or benefit of treatment. So acutely painful osteoporotic fractures occur mainly in older people um, due to thinning of the bones and usually come on after very minor trauma like a fall. They're very painful and disabling at the very beginning, but they often get better quite quickly. Sometimes suddenly they get better in one or two days. But on average, it takes about six weeks for the severe pain to get slowly better. And then slowly, slowly, people get better. So most people are asymptomatic after a year. There are no effective treatments. We just have to um, rest and, and have painkillers and wait for nature to take its course. 
This was a treatment, vertebroplasty, is the injection of bone cement into the fracture. So it's done under image guidance and can be done by radiologists or surgeons. And basically they just squirt some cement uh, that hardens into the fracture. It was first introduced in the late 1980s and it doubled in use in the 2000s. It, it just took off so that in places like the US, it was the standard. You got a fracture, you quickly had the cement into your, your back. If you had three fractures, cement into three, three um, vertebrae. Uh, at the time, I saw one study from Italy where they were doing it prophylactically. Uh, so you put it in the fracture, but you put it into the adjacent ones as well. And at that time, there was no high quality evidence that it was actually, that it actually worked or it was safe. And in fact, that was the best quality of evidence. What the, the graph that I showed you before, that was the quality of the evidence that this treatment worked. So in the mid 2000s, mid we thought we needed to do a placebo controlled trial of this. It was very difficult because in Australia, people were really scared of the treatment. Uh, and at the same time, there was a trial being done in the US and it was also really difficult there because people just wanted the treatment. They didn't want to go in the trial. The media didn't help. The media were promoting this as a miracle cure who enables the, the bed bound to walk again, the Lazarus effect. But eventually we finished the, the trials and we both published the, same, the trials together in the same issue of the New England Journal. And surprise, surprise, the treatment does not work. It, it's no better than a placebo. Uh, that the pain improves in everybody and there were beautiful examples of people who suddenly were, were better. I had a patient who was flown down uh, from country Victoria by ambulance, drove himself home uh, and at the end of the trial we actually found out he had placebo. So placebo was a really powerful treatment. You might ask, well if people are going to get benefit, it's, it's just the same as placebo, why don't we give it? Um, and I'll tell you why we don't give it in a minute. Uh, this is one of the ed editorials after we were published, uh, and, and it really was highlighting that this is a poster child for what we keep doing over and over again, in that we, we put things into practice before we've properly evaluated it. And so this became sort of like the poster child, and, and it was quite a famous trial. However, these are what, this is what can happen. The cement doesn't stay in the spine necessarily. And these are pictures of, um, this is cement, that, that, that line here, that's cement in the lungs, so it migrates up into the lungs. This is cement in the heart, perforating the heart. And this sausage thing around here is blood around the heart in the pericardium. This is cement where the spinal cord's meant to be. So this patient would be permanently paraplegic. So it's not safe um, and it has no benefits. And really, as this editorial said, uh, surely as a society, we can do better for our patients. We really need to stop putting things into standard practice before they've been properly evaluated. What happened in practice? This is an American study. And in red are the orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons that were doing the procedure. This is when we published the trial. And what you can see is that they gradually stopped doing it. This is when they put out their guide, the American guidelines, the orthopedic guidelines, strongly advising against its use, and they've basically stopped doing it. In purple are the radiologists. They didn't stop doing it, and in fact, they, um, they had a concerted campaign to um, trash the trials. Um, they put out position statements. They sent letters saying that they were going to fight this, as if this was some sort of fight, rather than just presenting the evidence. Um, they, they subsequently did three more trials, and this is a summary of the trials. This is what's called a Cochrane Systematic Review. And what you can see, I'm not going to go through it, but you can just see where those green dots are, that the, the three new studies that really showed exactly the same as the other studies. So they subjected more people to a clinical trial, even though we had already confirmed that it didn't work, and they still weren't able to show that it worked. What else happened? Well, the editor of uh, uh, the Medical Journal of Australia um, published this editorial talking about what happened. So um, people were trying to stop publication of the trial. Uh, they said that the journal's reputations would be trashed. 
Uh, and I started being harassed every day, every day, phone calls, emails, until Monash actually had to say that uh, threatened legal action restraining orders against the people that were harassing me, because they know it works. They weren't happy about this evidence. This is an, uh, an email I just thought for some humour. A few years later, um, an email just copied to me that uh, perhaps I'm a socialist charlatan, better suited to practise medicine in China or Cuba and hoping that uh, Dave Kalmus, the first author of the other trial, and I would actually get a fracture and, be, and have the same pain. So really nasty things. And you, I wake up in the morning to this sort of email, so I was scared to actually look at my email. And unfortunately, it still happens. It still happened this year. So who knew? You publish unpopular results. You're just doing your job. You truly don't know whether the treatment works before you start. I actually had a hunch that it worked, but I was just worried about that cement and whether it would increase the risk of adjacent fractures. But who knew it would lead to personal attacks? And we've now had COVID and you've seen personal attacks from people uh, like Tony Fauci, for example. It's happened to, client, to climate scientists. Um, and especially in this case where the treatment is lucrative for both the doctors who do it and the industry who provides it. And there was really an organised and systematic campaign to dismiss the trials as fake news, as indicated even by the title of this editorial. They also tried to change the wording in Wikipedia and the, the person that was a custodian of the Wikipedia page thought it was really strange and, and eventually it turned out that these were um, company doctors who were trying to change the wording and he'd change it back. So they go to really enormous lengths because it, people make a lot of money from this treatment. So we've now, I've, I've been involved in over 20, 25 trials now. Unfortunately, we start off with equipoise. We don't really know whether it works or not. But most of the things that I've studied just seem to not work. Uh, so we've looked at shockwave therapy for heel pain, platelet-rich plasma injections, which are really trendy now, and it also introduced into practice before evaluating uh, and really found that it makes no sense and it didn't work anyway. Uh, and we've also done things like uh, looking at arthroscopy for knee arthritis, surgery for shoulder pain, um, even medicinal cannabis, we published a review and a guideline. We really couldn't find evidence that cannabis actually helps people with pain, uh, but it does cause harm. But I didn't want you to think that only things don't work. Um, we have managed to find a few studies, a few treatments that actually do work and should be provided to patients. And I just wanted to highlight this trial, which was published in JAMA this year. This was going back again to that problem of poor care for people with back pain. And we worked with the Department of Health uh, to, to give um, high requesters of 11 types of imaging um, feedback about their imaging rates compared to their peers. And it was highly effective. Uh, we, we found that over 12 months, uh, there were 47,000 less uh, imaging tests um, performed among these high requesting doctors. So this is the way forward. We really need to investigate how we can better get evidence into practice. So the take home messages from this part is that it's much harder to study accepted treatments, expect pushback. I was already getting pushback during the trial. People were calling me unethical for doing the study. I was calling them unethical for, for giving people cement without actually knowing whether it was beneficial. It's also much harder to stop doing things if you subsequently find that they're not helpful. Vertoplasty is still being performed. I, I really want um, people to be sceptical of unproven treatments because more often than not, they won't work. And we need much more efforts to translate our evidence that we do know into practice more quickly. My final topic is uh, too much medicine, overuse of medicine, too many procedures, uh, over-treatment, over-diagnosis, over-testing, and there's a plethora of journals that have focused on this over the last uh, decade. Uh, this is uh, John Ioannidis, who's uh, at Stanford and talks about this. Most developed countries are spending and wasting so much that healthcare has become one of the leading public dangers for health. So can you imagine that, that we're actually, the biggest public danger is, is the care that we provide to our patients. 
And the bottom line is, and this has been found uh, time and again, 60% of what we do is effective and has uh, in line with guidelines. 30% is low value, doesn't work. Uh, 10% is actually harmful. And this is the huge problem that, that my current research is really trying to address. The financial review in 2015 estimated that federal and state governments and health insurers were spending about $30 billion on overtreatment of, of patients. Most of it was for new improved, so instead of getting an X-ray, you get an MRI. Uh, instead of getting an, an injection into your arm for shoulder pain, you get it done under ultrasound guidance. So more services and, and more costly services. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because firstly, the patient getting the care isn't deriving benefit and, and can sometimes derive harm. It wastes valuable healthcare resources, so the people that really deserve our care can't get them. And it also significantly harms the planet. So healthcare is responsible for 7% of the carbon footprint in Australia. I don't know if you're aware of that. But if we could just reduce low value care, so just that 30% and 40%, we could save over 8,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions per year just by eliminating low value care because it's not helping our patients and it's also not helping the planet and it's harming other people through climate change. So just a couple of examples. This is uh, shoulder ultrasound uh, and it, these, these slides are a bit out of date but you can see the large rise in, in largely useless tests and the large costs that we're wasting on these useless tests. These tests will find abnormalities because most people have abnormalities as, as they get older. The problem is that they're equally as common in people who have symptoms and people who don't have symptoms. And it leads to more, te more treatments. So th these people then go on and get this ultrasound guided injections. And we know that ultrasound provides no extra value. It actually doesn't matter where, where you inject someone, the effectiveness is exactly the same. You can just put it in the arm and, and it will have the same effect. This is um, one of my favourite slides showing what happens, uh, no one gets a spinal fusion in public hospitals, um, but there's a lot happening in private and there's mounting overwhelming evidence that fusion isn't helpful and often makes the patient worse. So finally, we, together with Ian Harris, who's a professor of orthopaedic surgery, and I decided that we wanted, you know, lots of people, lots of medical people know that we have a problem of too much medicine, but I don't think that the public are aware. So we wrote this book called Hypocrisy, How Doctors Are Betraying Their Oath. It's based on the Hippocratic Oath, and if you look at the Hippocratic Oath, each pledge in that oath is really pertinent to the problems of modern medicine. So we, we, we had the book, each chapter in, that, in, in the book talks about the problems um, according to that oath. Uh, and we wrote the book because our medical system is not fit for purpose and poses a threat. It's a business model that prioritises actually providing medical care rather than health. And it's based on preventing rather than um, treating rather than preventing illness. We know that the big breakthroughs in our health and our longevity has had nothing to do with medicine. It's been about no wars, clean water, clean air, those sorts of things. We know that many of our superficial assumptions about medicine are wrong. There's over-medicalisation, over-diagnosis, over-treatment, and these are just rife, not just in our field of medicine, but more broadly. And we believe that doctors really have poor science literacy, that poor understanding of clinical epidemiology, and they have this unfounded belief in their personal experience over evidence provided by others. And so we just wanted to raise awareness, we want to start conversations and just encourage people to be a little bit more sceptical. We also wanted to focus on the doctor's role. A lot's been written about the drug, you know, pharmaceutical industry, but it's really the doctors that prescribe, that do the cutting. So we wanted to really focus it back on what, what we should be doing about the problem. There are many reasons why doctors overestimate benefit and underestimate risks. Um, as I've mentioned before, they really just don't understand the evidence. They want to believe they're helping and they are more accepting of evidence that confirms their beliefs. That's called confirmation bias. When there's uncertainty, we want to assume that things work rather than waiting. 
Um, like gamblers, we have miracle thinking, uh, and so we tend to overestimate the probabilities of success and underestimate the failure. And if we don't understand the evidence, then we're easily led by drug reps and, and opinion peer leaders or whoever. It's in our interest. We want to feel valued. We want to feel like we're doing a good job. And it's in the interest of patients to think that what we're doing is in their best interest. But it's not always. And finally, I just wanted to finish on my collaborations and partnerships. Uh, so really, I've been standing on the, the shoulders of giants for all of my career. Um, I thought I'd just show you the number of people that I've written more than five papers with over the last decade and where they come from. So you can see that it's it, lots of people. So lots of people contribute to this work, research. It's it's really not mine. It's ours. It's a, it's um, you know, a we, a plural thing. Um, I wanted to highlight this clinical trial network that we started called the Australia New Zealand Musculoskeletal Trial Network and these are the wonderful people that started it with me um, and our vision is to optimise uh, health through high quality collaborative research. Uh, our mission really is to identify the key questions. There's a lot of waste in research as well, a lot of silly questions where we already know the answer or it's not going to improve outcomes and we should stop doing that research. We wanted to improve the quality. Uh, we wanted to stop duplication. We wanted to help people to do it better. Uh, we wanted to advocate for research. Uh, we wanted to foster much more collaboration. Um, and importantly, we started this with consumers. Consumers have been with us every step of the way and I've just appointed the first consumer to do her own research in our department. And we do lots of education and mentoring and training. We have a wonderful consumer panel. Uh, I won't highlight this slide, but we were lucky enough to get a CRE, and we went from asking 100 trialists to join us in this endeavour to over 400. We've published as a group 17 trials now in major journals, and we've just been lucky enough to get uh, funding for the next five years, and we have even bigger plans. Uh, so these are some of the people in my department in the top two boxes. Uh, that's Ian Harris and that's us arriving in Bellagio. We were lucky enough to get a fellowship um, to work on the book for four weeks, staying at the Bellagio Centre, at the Rockefeller Centre in Bellagio. And everything above the, the, those low buildings there is the Bellagio Centre. Mm -hmm. And we stayed in that villa up the top. Uh, it, was a, it was a killer though, it was the middle of summer. So it was a lot of steps going up and down. And then the bottom right is Wiser Healthcare, and I put the website up. These are an amazing group of people that, that have come together to work on this problem of too much medicine. And Alex Barrett there is really leading our new initiative, which is trying to develop carbon neutral healthcare. Um, so thank you very much um, to RSVP, RS, RSVP, <laughs> RSV, and thank you for listening. And then if we've got time, I might just show you one more ad. You hurt your back. You go to the doctor. You go to bed. <laughs> a couple of days, beautiful. But any more than a couple of days, have a look at this. Your back, he goes soft. Your brain, he goes soft. No good. Bed rest can make your back pain worse. Better to go back to work. Just take it easy, okay? Leave the hard work for somebody else. You're a fool. Endorsed by the Australasian Faculty of Occupational Medicine. Thank you. I had hardly know where to start, but finishing with Con Lafruta is a good way to for you to finish. That's lovely. <laughs> I haven't seen him for ages, and it makes me think. Media for good. Media did good. Media for good. That's one for someone who worked in the media industry for 31 years to actually understand that it can be used profitably. Um, a colleague of mine talked about. I've just picked up a couple of things which we might discuss briefly and stimulate the audience to provide us with some questions. He always said we actually have a, a, an illth industry, not a health industry, in this in this country. We actually deal with illness rather than preventative health, which I think is a really strong message. But I'm fascinated with the notion of a carbon carbon neutral health industry. Is that how is that emerging? So we well UK are way ahead of Australia, yeah. and and so in Australia, as I said, seven percent the 
healthcare is responsible for 7% of the carbon footprint. Amazing. It's amazing, isn't it? And it's things like, I haven't shown you, but uh, things like MRI and CT scans, they use, consume enormous amounts of electricity. Uh, they stay on when they don't need to be on uh, overnight. They need to be kept at a certain temperature. It's hospital care that takes up a lot of that. And again, that's partly is the energy. Uh, we know that there's some anaesthetic gases like um, desferamine and uh, also nitrous oxide that have very high yeah. um, carbon. And we don't need them. We, we can find low carbon alternatives. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking, for example, the airline industry is about 4% of global emissions. Exactly. Um, so combined with you know, cement industry makes it about 8%. So that's an enormous amount. And it's all that energy intensive equipment. It's all of that. It's In fact, 7% is... That's the whole of South Australia is, is, is responsible for 7%. So it's the same as all of South Australia, all the trucking, all, everything. Remarkable. Um, the other thing that... I, so we, we had a function earlier about uh, in, in investing eight new fellows and I, had, I chose to make some remarks at the end about where the Royal Society might fit in future things. We've just released a major piece of work we've done this year on biodiversity. There's probably a little summary one page around for people who are interested in seeing that. But we, one of the things we want to do is to reinvigorate the use of this building for the purposes of science speaking with one voice. That I think that your comment about, uh, I, a decade ago or more, I spoke to graduating scientists at University of Melbourne saying you're going into the world today at a time when science hasn't been challenged as strongly as since Darwin took on the church. And I think we've faced that over the last 10 years. I mean, this guy over here, classic in his field, but he's become a client, uh, a, a, a client spokesperson because he understands the science. And I think we really need to challenge. I think that's a great role. How do we do that? How do we go about um, elevating the value and importance of science in science-based science decision-making at all levels? Because that's really that's where talking. you're at. Yeah. I think, I mean, we, we write about it in the book, uh, but we, we think it's got to be all the way through from schools, so introducing uh, science literacy. We have numeracy and literacy. We really need science literacy. We need to uh, get people to understand about evidence in medicine, uh, and then that will hold them in good stead when they become patients. We think consumers can be much smarter. They can, they can, there are online courses learning how to critically understand evidence. We need much better training for doctors and health professionals. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've just really that, upset about that, that, you know, people aren't science literate. People I know in, in our field are not science literate. But the doctors got swept up in that treatment for the... Um, oh, absolutely. Didn't they? They're still, they're still caught up. Some people still believe it, still believe it. In fact, it was removed from the uh, medical benefits schedule after our trials. Uh, it was only there as an interim. Uh, I can tell you that it's back, but it's only back. It's only for people that have a fracture less than three weeks duration and only at this certain level in the spine. And that's because of what we call post hoc subgroup analyses, trying to find a group that works. And so now you can get it if, if you have it pain less than three weeks and you have it at L1 and, you know, ri ridiculous. Makes no scientific sense. Um, but there are people out there that, that are pushing and pushing and pushing all the time. And there's not that many of us who are pushing science. There's so many more people who, who have vested interests. You'd be pleased to know I don't really have a back problem. I have a fascia joint problem, which I suspect was from carrying too many science textbooks in a school bag as a schoolboy, but it's not, I've had it for 30 years, but it's not getting any worse, and my back's very strong, so it's not a problem. Let's go to some, there are lots of questions. Where shall I start? I'm gonna go at our Vice President, Kat de Berg Day. Thank you, is, oh, this is on, yes. I guess this is a bit of a, a follow-on question from that. Um, I'm wondering if you see any uh, difference in how many of these low-value treatments are being given by doctors in different, in different age groups. I guess I'm wondering if there's particular generations of doctors coming through that are more or less scientifically literate or if it's a question of 
doctors coming out of their training and then not staying current from that point? I think, I think um, Ian and I have both observed that the younger doctors are, are definitely better uh, we, and we can, they're trainable and they're, they're teachable. Um, it's really when I, I, I go and lecture and, and, you know, an old man who's an orthopaedic surgeon says, oh, get with the program, Lassie, this new technology, we've got to go with it. You know, they don't get that new technology just detects more and more things that probably will never harm anybody in their lifetime. So I think it is getting better and I have hope uh, that, that there'll be people coming up behind me that will be able to continue this work. David Walker. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Great talk. Um, I'm wondering, have you been able to influence the chiropractors and also the complementary medicine people? Because it seems to me, uh, my impression is that they don't actually follow academic medicine and evidence very, very much at all. Is that fair enough? Uh, well, I think like all health professionals, there are good chiropractors and bad uh, chiropractors and for any of my um, past or current PhDs and postdocs who happen to have trained as a chiropractor, I'm putting in a good word for you. So there are really good um, people across all professions uh, and it's really the ones that are science-based. So chiropractors treat back pain like physios and there are good physios and there are bad physios. There are good chiros and bad chiros. So it's a, really about the evidence. At the back. Um, hi, my name is Doug McCann. Um, thanks for the talk, it was fantastic. Um, I think you've shown that there's good and bad medicine or a whole range of levels of medicine which are effective. But I think we've also good, got good and bad science. And just to say the science says this doesn't necessarily mean the science is good. Sometimes the science is based on exactly, as you're saying, with the medicine. So we've got to be really careful when you're promoting the idea that science says so, that the science is good and it's high quality. I totally agree. Uh, as I, I alluded to, there is a lot of bad bad uh, research being done, a lot of wasteful research, uh, a lot of useless research and a lot of low quality research. So it's really, I'm talking about science literacy and, and high quality tools that we use to make sure our, our um, research is as good as it can be. And it's never going to be perfect, but if we can eliminate the biases that we know about, then we'll get closest to the truth. Um, it's, it's obviously time to get Con the fruiter back. You've got the evidence <laughs> to do that, uh, the energy to do that again. Now, I was going to ask you, pain is such a, um, a subjective uh, experience. Does that kind of influence any of the things you measure uh, as it's the end result of what you're looking at? Change to, to the pain so, level? How does this influence what you're doing? So when you, when you do research, you're comparing um, within the person. So you're comparing your pain before to after and then you're taking an average across a whole lot of people so it, it it doesn't really matter that we each feel pain differently and have different different um, perception of pain uh, as long as you've minimized bias and patients don't know what they've re truly received then you're going to minimize that that bias so you want to say overall that your treatments worked though in general so yeah, so you, what, you, what you do when you do a study is you work out on average what the treatment effect is and, and if it doesn't work, it's very unlikely that you'll find a subgroup in whom it will work. Uh, and that's another thing that I didn't talk about that people don't understand. But if you do a big study and there's no benefit overall on average, then trying to find a subgroup where there is a benefit to get to that null or no benefit, you'd have to have another group of people that actually got worse from the treatment, which often doesn't make sense. So what happens when we publish our research and it doesn't work is people then go off and try and see whether it works in subgroups. And that's fine, but they have to prove that it works in that subgroup. And, and more often than not, if it doesn't work in, a, in, in the general group, it's not going to work in a subgroup either. Bill. Thanks, Rachel. Pre very interesting. President Emeritus, Bill Burke. <laughs> Rochelle, thanks, Rochelle. A very interesting talk. Um, however, I'm a uh, survivor of lower back pain, and I, I contend that there's lower back pain and lower back pain. Mm -hmm. uh, my episode coincided exactly with the period 1990 to 2000 when those ads were on. I remember <laughs> the ads, but I don't remember them influencing me. Uh, all I know is that I kept 
playing sport, being active, but the episodes I had got worse and worse. And in the end, the physios who I was enthralled, enthralled to, uh, the uh, cortisone injections did nothing. The only thing I could resort to was surgery. And that fixed it. It was very carefully done. The, after imaging, the surgeon knew exactly what to do. And that fit, I've been pain free ever since. So I get a bit annoyed when I see ads that tend to criticise orthopaedic back surgeons because they're only in it for the money, because I know from first hand experience that that's not the case. So that's just a. Yeah, a don't. Uh, I'm not. Bill's a, Bill's a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not saying all back surgery is you bad. Like and in fact, we had surgeons, they were fighting with the, with the other health professionals to. Um, to promote certain ads and, and their actual ad in, in the campaign was if uh, someone said you need an operation, get a second opinion. And we know, we've done studies, we've done studies in um, Brazil, for example, where we've, we've got, um, the, Im the insurance company were really worried about the high rates of surgery in private patients. So they set up a clinic in the public hospital where people could get a second opinion. And it turned out, so let's say there were a thousand patients. Uh, we looked at whether the diagnoses were the same across uh, and whether the recommendation was the same. And there was huge variation. Many people that were offered surgery uh, didn't need surgery. And we followed these people up and their outcomes from not having surgery was exactly the same as people who had the surgery. So I guess I can't talk about individual cases, um, there are always exceptions to the rule. Uh, rules are always meant to be broken, as my family and I are fond of saying. Um, so, you know, you, you, but, but what I'm trying to say is that just because some, you got better may have nothing to do with the surgery. We know in arthroscopy that it's to do with the rest. So people that have an arthroscopy actually can't do anything for a few weeks. And, and it could be that that's what actually helps. Um, but I'm not saying that n there should be no surgery. Bill's been an exception in many ways too. <laughs> Jane Canestra. Rochelle, thank you for a brilliant presentation and a brilliant career. Your output has been stellar thank and uh, is of very important work because evidence is the key. Um, the challenge then is in translation, the impact and whilst you've had successes in changing some proceduralists, moving them away from particular procedures, I'm wondering if there's greater opportunities through collaborating with health economists so that you influence more uh, what Medicare items are scheduled and so forth. Um, because I see that a bit like the um, tax, uh, taxes on tobacco, um, which of all the many public health campaigns, the biggest changes in reduction in tobacco consumption coincided with increases in the excise on tobacco. Sure. I mean, I think those are really good ideas and we, and we might think about obesity and, and the, the we treat obesity, we treat the, the complications from obesity rather than stopping big people come obese in the, in the first place. Um, we do work with health economists. Um, I can't say too much about how, uh, about the medical benefits schedule because I'm on MSAC actually, but I can tell you that MSAC and PBAC work very much in the same way now and new things won't get on to the um, subsidised list until there is, until there's actually evidence of um, efficacy, number one, uh, and cost effectiveness and, and lack of harm, uh, number two. Uh, unless it's, you know, something really rare and there's nothing else, you know, there's ex always exceptions, as I said, but the system now is, is good for that. The problem is that there are a lot of things that are on that list that were grandfathered on uh, and, you know, even the, Met the Medicare review tried to change some, uh, that there are powerful lobbies that don't want those things to change. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, what I'd love to do is get rid of fee-for-service. I know, we, you know, that, that's probably impossible. We just had salaried doctors. Uh, and when I, when I started looking at imaging in the UK, I was in the UK, and they didn't have a problem with uh, inappropriate imaging because the radiologists were salaried, and why would I do that test? It's not warranted. You know, I'd rather just sit back and do nothing, you know. So, so that started me thinking about this problem that we have, that, that it's the fees that 
It's the, the services that drive the health system rather than the needs of, of, of us. And the service sellers. Yep, and the yeah. service sellers. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they, they, they want it, you know, but I'm trying not to be hard on them because I think some of it is they don't understand and it's not their fault. You know, we would all want to maximise our income if we could. So, it, you know, the system's working against, mm. against them. It's not really their problem, you know, their fault. Mike, you might, I'm, I'm reminded from Jane's question, I'm going to revert to biodiversity for a second. Jane's question reminds me that we proposed in our response to the biodiversity dilemma we have in the state, a tax on pet food given that we have more invasive species of plants and animals in this country than native plants and animals, we spend billions and billions on pets, uh, which are part of the problem. So it's, it's an interesting area to play in, Jane, and in my, I hadn't thought about applying to this, but so it does. Rob Day. Yes, thank you for a really interesting talk. I, I was impressed by this fact that um, yeah, there's, there are these groups of people who see a benefit in maintaining a practice. And I worked with fishermen to try and get them to collaborate with each other and so on. And uh, to begin with, they all saw a benefit in competing with each other and each catching more fish. But the most valuable thing I could do to actually get them to change was to explain incentives why they would benefit from changing. And of course, in your situation, that probably means that you need to change the, the, the way in which the people become, um, you know, the incentives they have for doing the surgery. So <clears throat> if um, a, a practice was set up that, that shows that in order to maintain your Medicare benefit, you have to actually collect the data for long enough to show that there is an overall benefit. Mm. That might change the situation. Yeah, that, I mean, that's called value-based healthcare, and that's been suggested, that, that we pay people for good outcomes, not for actually providing the service. Um, and I think that's well worth exploring. We also have a problem that we, the, there are the wrong incentives. So the incentives are there to do more care, uh, and we don't fund things that we know work, um, that they're not funded. So th this, there's a system problem, a really big system problem as well. Katrina? Hi, I'm just wondering what the general public can do, or like as a patient, what can you do? I know that you were talking about scientific literacy, and I totally agree, very, very important, but a lot of the data, it's behind paywalls and things like that. So it's not like as a patient, I have back pain, I can look up, you know, is this going to actually be beneficial for me? So do we need to rely on change among healthcare practitioners or do we need to rely on people like you to like actually evaluate every single thing? Like what, what can we do? So, uh, so again, we've got some tips in the book for consumers. The first thing is that you can ask questions. So when you see uh, a health professional and they suggest this or that, you go, what's the evidence for that? You know, what would happen if I did nothing? What, what would happen if I did something else? Um, what are the potential harms? Um, what's, what, what does the evidence say? Those sorts of questions. And I know that's, you know, people say, well, that's easy for you to say, but in the doctor's consultation, it might be very different. Um, I also tell doctors they should put a sign up in their waiting room saying, this practice um, asks patients to please ask their doctor questions, you know, to try and, try and make that a two-way thing. Um, there are reliable sources of information. Um, the Cochrane Library is freely available to all people in Australia. Uh, and I'm the, I'm the editor of the Cochrane Musculoskeletal Back and Neck Group. Um, there are lay summaries of all our reviews. Uh, there are things like Wikipedia, which we found often provides good information in our field. Uh, we find that doctors' websites often don't pro provide things uh, fully inform about the evidence. They just say things are great, there's very little side effects. So I wouldn't go there. Uh, but there are lots of things you can, you can do like that. Uh, ask questions is probably the most important. I don't know if you've heard of the, um, there's a you know, worldwide thing called Choosing Wisely and they have five questions that you, everyone should ask their doctor. And I would encourage you to do that. And if doctors don't like the, being asked questions, then they're not the doctor for you. There's a question on the line, and then we'll come back to you, Mike. 
The question from uh, one of our online viewers tonight is uh, they were interested to know whether there was any evidence for uh, what's it, the plasma, plasma rich, platelet rich plasma injections uh, that it was not beneficial in other areas such as uh, glute uh, gluteal tendinopathy. Okay, so. <laughs> you better explain that to everybody because So, good platelet rich plasma is you, you have a patient, you take some blood from them you spin that blood down, and then you stick it where they have pain. It was never tested properly. There were really hardly any preclinical studies. It just sounded good in theory. Um, platelets are meant to release things that are good for healing. Um, but we all have platelets in our body. Why wouldn't it just get there by its own steam through the blood system? Um, we've now done uh, two trials, one for osteoarthritis of the knee, um, one for tennis elbow, um, and both, uh, and we've done systematic reviews, and basically it works just as well as you'd expect, um, which is just as good as placebo. Uh, it costs, it's, it was, it's actually not on the MBS, so people pay a lot of money for it. Um, I see people who often go back and have more even though it didn't work. Somehow they get three or four shots and they still don't understand that it's never going to work. Um, I, so um, PRP doesn't work for anything. Um, we've written, a rec recently we wrote an editorial about why, why, why we should stop doing it, why it was never going to work in the first place. The hypothesis for why it worked was never tested in, in the lab uh, and it's, it's just a huge um, source of money. Um, so uh, if you're going to ask me about stem cells, uh, again, the evidence so far uh, for osteoarthritis of the knee at least is that, is that it's not strong that it works. So the answer to the question is that there's actually lots of evidence, but the high certainty evidence is that it doesn't work. Mike. Um, I'm going to be a little bit of a contradictor. I had a very nasty incident in my early 30s. And ever since then, periodically, I could have great back trouble by doing something entirely innocuous. But my method is to go to bed and gradually improve with a bit of heat. But that aside, what you haven't mentioned is damage to the pads between the vertebrae. Now, the story that I've got is ruptured from the fluid, can cause irritation of the nerves. Could you? Give us some, give us some idea about that situation as you see it, please. So you're talking about when someone has severe pain going down their leg, that's when they're pressing on a nerve. Yes. Or even the leaky fluid. I um, don't know about leaky fluid. There's there's very little leaky fluid in the back, and there's some fluid around the spinal cord. Um, what we do know, and there's been two really good studies. We know that imaging on MRI scan and on X-ray both in the general population, all the changes that are commonly reported like degeneration, facet joint, arthritis, um, disc, disc bulges, anything you can imagine has absolutely no correlation with a person's symptoms either currently and that it also does not predict future problems. So these things are exceedingly common in people with and without back pain. And even though they might be slightly more common in people who have pain, you can't know whether they're of relevance in an individual patient. So that's for back pain. For sciatica or radicular pain or pain that's referred down the leg, uh, that can be caused by pressure on a um, nerve from a, a disc that's bulging. Um, that is true. Um, but most of those also get better, whatever you do, going to bed, having a bit of heat. Um, some of them we do operate on and they need to be operated on because people lose um, their, their nerve function, they get a drop foot, they have intractable pain. Um, and for those patients, then a laminectomy or taking the pressure off uh, is a worthwhile procedure. Um, but in fact, most people, I've had actually two episodes of sciatica myself. One was during... Um, uh, looking at grants for NHMRC. Uh, I couldn't sit on the plane. I stood the whole week in a, in a chair, walked around the room, and someone was actually doing a trial of, um, of um, opioids for sciatica and trying to get me to go in the trial. And I said, I'll, maybe it's six weeks. <laughs> My family are trying to get me to see someone. It's six, both times around six weeks, it just went away. So I'm sure I'll have another episode sooner or later. Mark, there's a question here. Master, gentlemen. 
Uh, whiplash is a lot less common than it used to be because of, of seat restraints on the, on the back of, of uh, car seats. But do you have any experience with that? Whiplash? I, I do actually. Um, so whiplash uh, as an entity, I haven't seen in recent years. Uh, it's seen in some places and not others. It depends on the, the rules around um, compensation and who pays for the medical care. So people often get whiplash injuries from, from um, you know, having a, a, being hit from behind in a car. Um, but, but if you treat it just like you treat um, anything, like back pain, then it tends to go away. And in New South Wales and in places in Alberta, they, they changed to a no-fault system. So everyone got the care they needed. And the, the, the problem actually just disappeared. Uh, so again, it's like, I don't know, RSI, it's a, it's a pseudo epidemic where um, it's the beliefs of society that, that places on the pain, that, you know, the workers were being injured, uh, the, the doctors were really worried, they're all off work. Uh, and then um, the legal people came in and there was compensation. Uh, and then it was realised that, that actually it was just, you know, nothing, it would go away uh, and and it went away. The, the um, people would then thought they were malingerers if they had RSI. Uh, the lawyers um, started losing. Um, the doctors just started treating it like normal everyday, you know, back pain or, or musculoskeletal pain and the problem completely disappeared. Uh, it's been replicated. It's been cumulative trauma disorders in the US when I actually lived in Canada. Um, there was something at the turn of the century called Riders cramp in the UK, which is a similar thing. It's really, you know, a lot of things come from societal beliefs. The lawyers will think of something else. Absolutely. Canterberg Day again. Can't help myself. Um, so, a, a lot of this, you know, you mentioned on one of your slides that patients have a vested interest in. Uh, using these low quality treatments because they, they want to get better and they want to feel like they're doing something. And it got me thinking about this tendency that people have to go to uh, alternative medicine providers or you know people who offer them weird woo-woo treatments because they feel like they're getting listened to and they're getting a treatment even though it's not going to work. Yep. I just wondered if you had any thoughts or suggestions about what can be done about that phenomena, that if they go to a doctor and the doctor says, just go home, you'll be fine, they're not going to feel very good about that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think that you're right, that doctors, more and more, I see, they, they feel like they have to do something. Even if they know it doesn't work, they just have to be seen to be doing something. Part of the problem is that we, it, we've created patient expectation that we can fix everything, number one. Uh, and number two, um, not giving an X-ray or not giving strong painkillers isn't doing nothing. It's what we should be doing is providing advice, um, seeing what the, their, their, their beliefs are, seeing if they have misconceptions that are harmful. Um, we should be um, reviewing them. We should be supporting them. So we, um, but I mean, a lot of that's difficult in, particularly in primary care, where they get I think six minutes for a consultation. So no wonder they go to other people. You know, we know, um, and this is controversial, but our studies have shown that exercise, you know, provided by physiotherapy, provides very small benefits. But the value of seeing a physio is that they provide education, they empathy, um, they, they support the patient, they listen to the patient, much like you know, other health practitioners that have more time. And really, we need to um, give doctors that same space um, to understand that not give, doing something, not giving them a test, not prescribing something isn't doing nothing. And, and I think that's a really common misconception. I was going to give you a break, Rachel, Shell, but we've got one last question from our treasurer, Sid Verma. Uh, I'm curious um, if you look, if you put these things on a spectrum, you know, one is the placebo where, you know, you go and imagine that everything is fine and things will be fine, so to speak, and then you have the intense treatment, you know, over treatment and MRIs and everything else. What about the natural treatments like, you know, sniffing on oil and you know, rubbing balms and those sort of things, or you know, eating an extra cucumber because it makes you feel good. Do, have you have you done any work in that sort of space, or you know, where does that sort of fit in the spectrum? Yeah, no. You mean deep eat and decorate? Yeah. So I, th I mean, firstly, 
I put complementary medicine and traditional medicine, there's no difference. It's, it, the question, that's not the question. The question is, has it been proven to be of benefit? Has it been tested? Do we know that it actually works? Are there any side effects or, or harms? Uh, so, you know, there are lots of complementary treatments that we, we know can be helpful. We know there is a lot that have never been studied, so I can't tell you whether it works or not. Uh, and then there are some that have been shown not to work. Like, and, and in my field of arthritis, you know, we, we see phases. You know, every, everyone's on garlic, then everyone's on celery seed, then everyone's on fish oil, and then everyone's on glucosamine and chondroitin, and then everyone's on rosehip oil is the current one. So that's sort of like this fashion. And, you know, if it doesn't, if it's not harmful, that I'm, I'm happy. And if, if I'm not paying for it, I'm happy. <laughs> you know, the government's not supporting it. But, you know, maybe some of these things will turn out to be helpful, but it needs to be properly evaluated. Yeah. Take a break. And Thank you. Just wait there, because I'm going to invite... To, yes, congrats. Well, well done. Thank you. Now may I invite Laureate Professor Peter Doherty, AC, to present the Medal of Excellence to you, Rochelle. Thank you. Well, great lecture. Thanks very much. Thank very you. informative. We've, you know, we've been dealing with this, um, the, the tension between evidence and medicine in, through the whole COVID pandemic, where, of course, the whole thing's got to be accelerated. And um, it's very difficult, as, as time goes by, to know where we are. I mean, the vaccines were evaluated at the outset. They matched the virus. Now the vaccines don't match the virus. Are they really helping? Are they not helping? Where's the evidence? Yeah, it's very hard. I it's difficult in, a, in, a, in a, a, a crisis situation. Can I talk about that for a sec? Yes, yes. So I didn't talk to you about my other area of interest in research is in living guidelines. And COVID's a perfect example where Australia really led the work the world where we developed recommendations about what to do about COVID. And these were updated every week. As soon as new evidence came to light, they changed the evidence. So when hydroxychloroquine, you know, we weren't sure, and then suddenly the evidence was in, it didn't work. And the guideline immediately told doctors to stop using it. Or when steroids were found to be helpful, then that was immediately um, well, you know, ivermectin. changed. Ivermectin, the same. Yeah, so. Sure. So I think there's a place for living guidelines where we actually update the evidence in real time as, as things happen. And COVID was an amazing sort of test case of that. Yeah, it, I mean, it was an incredible experience yes. to actually live through it rather than, than talk about pandemics to actually, and we all, and we all know a lot about pandemics. <laughs> <laughs> how many people on, we're actually at a real peak of cases how many people on the tram wearing a mask? I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Human, I think if I come back as after you know departing, I'd, I'd rather than being a dung beetle, I'd like to be a psychiatrist who actually <laughs> <laughs> tries to understand how the human mind works. That, that was great. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. We all work. And it doesn't have a hole drilled through it, so you can wear it around your neck, unfortunately. Let's get a photo together. Where would you like? Where would you like? Just put have it in front of the band here so we'll get a bit of a brain. Just tilt it down for us there, Michelle. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, and thank you very much, Rochelle. Can we have a round of applause again for, uh, for our medalist this year?